All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Grand Rounds. Today's Grand Rounds uh, is going to be a very important one. But before we go into the um, the actual makeup of it, uh, we're going to share uh, some of the routines. And this is the website that you will be able to find the um, recording for the next uh, uh, 12 hours or so to be able to take your credits for the CME session. Uh, for this particular CME uh, session, you would have to text now if you would like to, to the number 20395 to the number 888-816-4893. And you have 12 hours to send it as an SMS message, uh, given you have an active profile in the Rutgers Cloud CME. And if you would like to uh, specifically also get your MOC point directly to your ABM ID, complete the step one, and this particular link, which will again be displayed in the chat box, user room code future 63, answer the questions. And if you do that correctly, you will go right into with MOC credits into your ABM account. With that, uh, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and I'm going to look forward to welcoming the panel. For our panel, our grand round presenter is Dr. Galati, Martha Galati. And joining with Dr. Martha Galati, we'll have a panel discussion with Dr. Rachna Kulkarni and Dr. Yanting Wang. Welcome everyone. And now it's my time to introduce some of the most favorite people here. Uh, Dr. Galati, whom of course we know, we adore from the Twitter and her name and fame for the work that she has done. Dr. Kulkarni for the side of the prevention and women's clinic uh, and the my personal link to her. We are colleagues from my clinic in Nagpur in India. And Yanting Wang who has recently joined, has been uh, interested and is developing the women's clinic at RWJ Medi Medical School. Dr. Gulati uh, is the president of the American Society of Preventive Cardiology. Uh, she recently uh, moved to Cedar sinai Heart Institute as professor of cardiology and is the director of prevention, the associate director of the Barbara Streisand Women Heart Center and holds the Anita Dan Friedman Endowed Chair in Women's Cardiovascular Medicine and Research. She was a professor of medicine and inaugural chief of cardiology at University of Arizona. She also served as Editor-in-Chief of CardioSmart, the patient education arm of American Cardio College of Cardiology. She's author of the bestseller, Saving Women's Heart. She served as the Chair of National Pain Guidelines from the American Heart Association and ACC that was released in 2021. She has a strong commitment to women's health and women's uh, cardiovascular diseases and has won several awards and distinction, including being named as Crane's Chicago business is one of from the Crane Chicago business is one of Chicago's top 40 under 40. In 2011, she received the first credit coalition to reduce racial and ethnic disparities and cardiovascular out outcomes award from the ACC. And it was given to her in recognition of the contributions in cardiovascular health care for women patients. In 2012, she was awarded the National Red Dress Award for efforts to raise awareness in, in heart diseases for women and advancing research in the field. In 2019, she was chosen as the most influential woman in Arizona, and she also received in 2019 American College of Cardiology's Bernadine Healy Award for a leadership and accomplishment in the field of cardiovascular health for women. She is the principal investigator of the St. James Woman Take Heart Project, a study that examined cardiovascular risk factors of women. And she's the site PI and co-investigator of the VARIO trial that is funded by the Department of Defense. She's a co-investigator on the Women's Ischemic Syndrome Evaluation Y study, and previously has served as co-investigator on the Women's Health Initiative. She's very well published, and uh, she's Canadian by heart and completed a medical school in the University of Toronto. She went on to complete her internship and residency in cardiology fellowship at the University of Chicago and all throughout in community at ACC, AHA. She's adored as one of the most uh, sought after role model for women's health in cardiology. With that words, Martha, the floor is yours after your presentation. We'll take over and have a, a panel discussions. 
Thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. And I'm just going to pull up my slides here. And thank you also for inviting me here today as well. Um, quite an honor. And it's, you know, normally my background is sunny and, you know, beautiful. But today we're actually having a pouring rainstorm outside. So, um, you will see the rain nonstop behind me. But I'm going to talk about today about women in cardiovascular disease. Is there really a sex difference? And I'm going to hope to convince you that there is a sex difference, but there's also gender differences as well. So my disclosures are here. Um, and I think what we're going to go through today is I'm going to help you see that women are not small men, that there's differences due to gender, there's differences due to sex, and we need to address both of them if we're going to really be able to save women's hearts. But I'm going to end with talking about research related to women and ask you, where are the women? We are, have been treated as the other sex. I mean, this was written by Simone de Beauvoir many years ago, and really she hoped that this would be a passing of time, but that we would be considered the other sex. But since we're the majority of the population, there's going. what I'm going to show you is just how much work we need to do. So I, I think we all know, obviously, in this audience that cardiovascular disease is the leading killer of both men and women. At a time when we were making great strides in men's heart health, when we were starting to see dramatic reductions in mortality after the introduction of statins, we did not see the same thing in women. And that's probably because we weren't applying our guidelines in women in the same way. But you can see after 2001, we started seeing a reduction in mortality due to cardiovascular disease in women. And that's the beginning of the Go Red movement. That's the beginning of women-specific guidelines. That was actually 2001 is when uh, the Women's Health Initiative was released. And overnight, the number one prescription, which at that time was hormone replacement therapy, we finally had evidence about whether it was safe or not for women and what it did for women's hearts. And so now there's less women than men dying from cardiovascular disease overall. But again, what's concerning for both men and women is this increase in mortality and specifically affecting our younger population. So of the 1.3 million deaths in the United States, over 400,000 of them are due to cardiovascular disease. The next leading cause of death is chronic lung disease. Lung cancer accounts for about 65,000 deaths and breast cancer accounts for about 43,000 deaths. So tenfold greater risk of dying from cardiovascular disease than breast cancer. And yet we all know our patients think that they're gonna dry from breast cancer, not heart disease. And you can see just here, you know, even if we talk about prevalence, 13.8 million women living with some form of cardiovascular disease and 3.8 million women living with breast cancer. So this bikini approach to women's health has been long discussed. I met Dr. Nanette Wanger, who I consider the mother of women in heart disease. She talked about this when I was a medical student back in Canada. And she talked about, you know, really we'd taken a bikini approach, essentially looking at the breast and the reproductive system and almost ignoring the rest of a woman when we talk about women's health. And that was more than two decades ago. And more recently, I've written at least three editorials that you see listed below where I say, where, when are we going to move beyond the bikini and protect a woman's heart? Because even though that has been mentioned for a long time, we still don't seem to be able to get fully past that. What I'm going to talk about today is really about the persistence in high mortality in women who have heart disease. And I'm gonna use acute coronary syndrome actually as the, the example, just because that's what we have the most data on. But specifically for acute coronary syndrome, year after year, data comes out showing that women have a higher mortality when they present with an acute coronary syndrome, particularly after STEMI. We have lots of data, and this is just a recent publication confirming yet again using a large database, the ISACS archives data, showing again, you know, no surprise to any of us, but women have a higher mortality after acute coronary syndrome. 
again, particularly the STEMI group. We know that from another recent publication in the last year, looking at the Virgo data, again, young women, women under the age of 55, have more adverse outcomes than men in the year after discharge. So more hospitalization, also more non-cardiac hospitalizations as well. So publication after publication, we keep saying this, but let me show you all the gaps that we have. I want you to pay attention to what I'm presenting and ask yourself, is it sex or is it gender? Sex obviously is biologically influenced. And so every cell has a sex and therefore every gene and every molecule is influenced by that sex. So whether you're XX or XY, that influences so many things. It influences whether you can get pregnant or not. It influences your hormonal status. But gender also comes into play, how we're seen by society. It's a social construct, but how we're seen affects our lifestyle. It affects our access to care. It affects our employment. It affects where we live. It affects the affordability of the drugs that we are prescribed if we get them. And both ultimately matter in terms of overall health and certainly for cardiovascular health. But let's look at acute myocardial infarction data, again, because we have large registries and registries teach us a lot about how well we treat people. And these have been used to really look at guideline directed care. So acute myocardial infarction, we know if you're a woman, if you get, you're less likely to go for a cath or a PCI, but if you go for a cath, women have a longer door to balloon time. If fibrolytics are used as they are in some places, again, less use in women, but door to needle time is longer for women. When we look at guideline directed medical therapy, whether 24 hours or upon discharge, again, look, for women are less likely to receive guideline directed medical therapy. And when we look at readmissions for women, those are higher compared with men. And these trends persist over time. All of this should be of no surprise to us that mortality is higher for women. I already showed you two examples of prior studies. Higher mortality, particularly in the ST elevation myocardial infarction group, and particularly in younger women. And a recent paper that we just published looked at, is it unique to one country or a few countries? No, it's not unique to America. It's a global problem. And in fact, we only countries that we don't have representative data on is the African continent where we don't have a lot of data based on sex, but everywhere else where we have data on, based on sex, we see these gaps in care. Just some examples. So here you can see women presenting with chest pain. They use this study used the National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey. They look from 2014 to 2018, and this represents 29 million emergency department visits in young people, people under the age of 55, and they had to present with chest pain. Well, women were significantly less likely to be triaged as an emergent case. Women waited 10 minutes longer than men to be evaluated. Women compared with men were less likely to undergo an EKG, less likely to receive cardiac monitoring, less likely to be seen by a cardiologist or any other consultant. And they were not surprisingly less likely to be admitted to the hospital or to an observation unit. And these same findings were also seen in people of color. But again, if they present with chest pain, we're not saying they presented with a different symptom, but they're presenting with chest pain and yet we treat them differently, despite it being the number one killer of both men and women. Secondary preventative care we know is underused in women. This is just one study that I could have used multiple studies, but this study, they looked at patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So over 600,000 patients. And they asked just two simple questions. Did women compared to men get statins and, and who got high intensity statins? Well, you can see in the United States, we do such a terrible job with statins. More than half our patients do not get statin therapy. But of course, everyone with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease needs a high intensity statin and only a quarter of patients got high intensity statins. But the likelihood 
of getting a high intensity statin was greater if you were a man compared with being a woman. We have data on younger people, people, young people under the age of 55 who have had an acute myocardial infarction. And we know compared to men, women are less likely to get non-aspirin antiplatelet agents, lipid lowering therapies, beta blockers. So again, there's huge gaps in care and there's lots of data I could have shown you. I just chose some of my favorite studies. We also know women are more likely to be re-hospitalized after acute myocardial infarction. This is a study that looked at young men and women and older men and women. And women are in gray, men are in black, and the people under the age of 55 are the solid lines. So women were much more likely to be re-hospitalized than men, but younger women were much more likely to be re-hospitalized after acute myocardial infarction. So this is the year after acute myocardial infarction. And you can see within the first month, these lines start dividing, particularly in the younger population. So there's a lot of reasons for that, but certainly upfront under treatment is one part of it. Certainly, if they're not referred for cardiac rehabilitation, if they're, you know, if they, there's a lot of different things that could ultimately affect this, but those are at least some of the reasons that women do less well. And what we also know is that the sickest women do are treated less aggressively. So this is looking at people with STEMI, but in cardiogenic shock. So of course, many of these patients are going to die and we should be pulling out all the stops on these patients because they are so sick. But as you can see, this was using the national inpatient sample and they showed that women were less likely to undergo invasive cardiac catheterization or revascularization. They were less likely to receive mechanical circulatory support and women were more likely to die compared with men. Again, there were racial differences as well. Anytime I say things about women, you can probably substitute race because again, these are how we're seen and that there's something about how we're seen that we're treated less aggressively. So recently, again, I was asked to write an editorial about yet another study that showed a difference in outcomes um, for women. And we called, we entitled our editorial, Adding Insult to Infarct. And in, to some part, it was adding insult to us. Like, how many times are we going to write editorials? Why are we not doing studies to try to implement things that improve outcomes? Instead of showing that women do less well, we all know women are doing less well, but what are we doing to actually change it? So we focused a lot of this editorial on what we need to do next, what should be the next steps, because I think we're, we're sick of talking about this. Women are less likely to get guideline-directed medical therapy. Women are less likely to get referred to cardiac rehab. They have worse health status. They have a higher mortality rate. They have a higher hospitalization rate. So the next steps really need to be like, how can we close this gender-based gap? Because this is gender. There's a lot of things that are going on that are different in our care and what we give to women that are based on seeing them as women. There is studies looking at system-based approaches to try to improve outcomes. And this is just one example. There's a lot of different studies out there. I'm just, I like this one just for illustration, but what they did is they had a four-step STEMI protocol that four steps were the following, the standardized ED cath activation, which most of our hospitals have. They had a STEMI safe handoff checklist, which is in hospitals where, you know, in the ER, the sh people change. And so knowing what's been done could be helpful. If they didn't do PCI in their hospital, it was also immediate transfer to an to available cath lab. And then they use PCI approach, radial first approach to PCI. When they implemented this, you can see that's shown in the red bars. Prior to implementation is the blue bars. And the Y-axis represents the percent of men who did better. 
And you can see that after the protocols in place, women started doing better, meaning all these endpoints that they looked at, not just mortality, but literally all the endpoints, women started doing better. And in fact, for stroke, there was a reduction in stroke for women compared to men once this protocol was in place. So this is just one example of a system-based approach that works. And when we use, whether it's our electronic health record or these standardized protocols, these are ways for us to improve outcomes and improve the care of women. And, and we've talked a lot about this. This is just from a paper that I wrote. You know, of course we need women to increase the need for timely care, but I, I don't wanna blame our patients. I think there's a lot we need to do in our healthcare community and really increase the awareness and need for timely care. I think these standardized protocols help. I think artificial intelligence is something to think about, about how it might aid us in the care of our patients. And of course we need more research, but this is such a big issue because we've been talking about this for quite some time and not been successful at narrowing the gap after STEMI. Now, I, I used uh, acute coronary syndrome examples, but I, I can use other cardiac examples, okay? So this is heart failure. Heart failure at the Veterans Hospital. They looked at this, and they looked at heart failure at patients getting guideline-directed medical therapy. They asked, again, a very simple question. Just getting one guideline-directed medical therapy for heart failure after a new diagnosis of heart failure what differed between men and women. And you can see within 30 days of the diagnosis, women, only 22% of women were on at least one guideline directed medical therapy, but out after a year, only 40% of women are on at least one guideline directed medical therapy. Men, it's still not great. I'm not saying these numbers are great, but it's better than it is for women. And of course, the veteran hospital is a great place to be able to gather this kind of data because they know what prescriptions are, are written for these patients. And this is, you know, there's other examples of this as well, but I, I like this illustration where we can really follow medications closely. And there's other examples as well. Think about TAVR, how excited we were when the early partner trials came out Finally, women had done so poorly with surgical aortic valve replacement and the early TAVR trials actually said women did better than men with TAVR. And now that we have TAVR as a mainstay of our care, women are less likely to undergo TAVR. They're referred much too late. We know for atrial fibrillation, something that we see all the time, Atrial fibrillation, women are less likely to be adequately anticoagulated. Women are more symptomatic when they're in a fib, and yet we are less likely to give them rhythm control or offer them ablation procedures. Think about ICDs, CRTs, so many studies, but the early studies of CRT actually showed women did better when they received CRT compared with men for those who met that criteria. And yet now, our implementation data of who gets CRT, women are less likely to get CRT than men. And when we think about transplants, same thing, Tw women are only 25% of LVADs, 25% of transplants. There's obviously a lot of reasons for that, but certainly there may be some bias in our approach to deciding who gets transplanted. Now, some of you might say that, well, maybe women present differently. Maybe that that's a reason and the delay in the care could add to worse outcomes for women. Well, I'm going to use go back to uh, acute myocardial infarction as an example um, for symptoms, since that's probably one of the most common symptoms we see is chest pain or angina equivalent. What do we know about sex differences in presentation in, a contem in the contemporary literature? Well, the Virgo study is a study, again, of young men and young women who have all had a myocardial infarction. They're all under the age of 55. And we've learned a lot about the younger population from Virgo. 
Well, Virgo did look at the symptoms that people had with acute myocardial infarction, and they actually found that 90% of men and 90% of women actually reported chest pain. The difference between women compared to men was this. Women were more likely to have three or more accompanying symptoms, and chest pain may not even be the most important symptom that they experience. What's interesting about Virgo is the Virgo patients, again, all had a myocardial infarction, and they asked them, did you seek out care for these symptoms before you came to the emergency room, before the diagnosis of a myocardial infarction? And many had sought out care. Actually, more women had sought out care than men, but women were much more likely to be told that this is not cardiac, even though they, again, they all went on to have a myocardial infarction. The high stakes group wasn't age specific, but it's the group that brought us the high sensitivity cardiac troponins from the UK. And they collected also data on symptoms. And you can see here from the bullseye diagram that they created, red being women, blue being men, actually more women experienced the symptoms that we would consider typical for angina or acute myocardial infarction. And if you look at the ARME study, the ARME study used AI or cardiolinguistic technology. It listened in to the conversation between the patient and the physician. And again, it found 90% of women and 90% of men actually reported chest pain or chest discomfort. Women did have more other symptoms just as we've seen in other studies. But again, when we introduce AI into it, it hears what the women say. Maybe we don't listen to our patients quite as well as AI. So in our chest pain guidelines, which I had the honor of chairing, we actually made some recommendations. We said we need to really refine how we talk about chest pain. You know, we said non-cardiac is in, atypical is out, but we also said chest pain should not be described as atypical because it isn't helpful in nature. Most times when my fellows say somebody has atypical chest pain, they think that it's not cardiac rather than being a different way of presenting. And that's the point. It can be misinterpreted as benign in nature. And so we shouldn't use that word. We should use terms that are more specific to the underlying diagnosis. Cardiac, when we clearly think it's cardiac. Non-cardiac, when we think it's not cardiac and possibly cardiac when we don't know. I think this allows you know, a better approach and a better understanding for why you're doing what you're doing with the patient, why you need additional testing. Again, my point is 90% of women and men have quote unquote typical symptoms. So using the word atypical is just not helpful. Additionally, this point about women being at risk for heart disease may seem so obvious, and it's a class one recommendation to understand that when women present with chest pain, they're at risk for underdiagnosis, and potential cardiac causes should always be considered. But the fact is, is that women and symptoms have been dismissed in the past. And we made a class one recommendation to understand that women often have accompanying symptoms with acute coronary syndrome, even when they present with chest pain, and we need to be listening for them. And we hope that these recommendations narrow our gap in the care of women. So what about the sex differences in cardiovascular disease? Because most of what I've been talking about is about the gender differences. We know there's a difference in coronary artery disease in terms of sex. We've known this for quite some time. We've known that non-obstructive coronary disease is a problem, and it's more often seen in women. You can see from the old gusto trials where we learned a lot about acute myocardial infarction, whether we're talking about unstable angina, non-STEMI or STEMI, there was a fair portion of the po population that did not have obstructive lesions, even when they met the criteria for these different diagnoses. We know from the ischemia trial, more recent contemporary trial, that even when people had moderate to severe ischemia on stress testing, there was still, because that's what they needed to get into that trial, 
14% of them still had no obstructive coronary disease. So you can have symptoms and signs of ischemia without an obstructive lesion. And it's sort of an old world thought to think we're only talking about obstructive coronary disease. Some of the work that I did um, on ANOCA, the, we were one of the first groups to report that it wasn't benign to have non-obstructive coronary disease. We compared my population, the women take heart population to the WISE study, the Women Ischemia Syndrome Evaluation Study. We age and race matched our population. And you can see that, you know, the annualized event rate for people with signs and symptoms of ischemia was much greater than asymptomatic women. So it's not a benign disease process. And we now know that obstructive coronary disease is just one phenotype of ischemic heart disease. And we're at really at the early stages of really understanding the rest of this disease. We know this well, the obstructive lesions, and we can see it and we can act on it. But we still, we know that it's more than that. And again, we it affects a large population of women. It's estimated about three to four million uh, uh, women and men in the United States. And we also know that the cost related to repeat bouts of angina, heart failure hospitalizations, as well as repeat testing, costs as much as a single vessel obstructive lesion. So there's a lot still, I don't say that we have a lot of the answers yet, but we're getting there. That's why we do. We just closed on the warrior trial and we'll soon have the results for you on that. And so hopefully one day we won't have people in the cath lab saying, you know, this is what happened at least when I was in training. You know, it wasn't a heart attack at all. You had normal coronary arteries. That's what people used to say. Hopefully that's a thing in the past, because how do we explain when someone's symptomatic, when someone has EKG abnormalities, when they have troponin leaks, and we just tell them that those arteries, you know, just because there's not an obstruction, that it, there isn't an underlying problem. We know other sex differences, and I don't have enough time to go through all the sex differences, but Takasubo's cardiomyopathy is something that disproportionately affects women. And, not, and you know, postmenopausal women, you know, in for their acute chest pain, it represents 10%. So that's pretty common. We're seeing this more and more. It isn't benign as well. There's about a 5% in hospital mortality with Takasubo syndrome. And of course, there's actually about 20% left with persistent abnormalities. So I know a lot of people have said, oh, broken heart syndrome, you know, it's not a big deal. It's going to go away, but it is a big deal. And it's, we still don't know how to tell who's going to have a recurrent Takasubos, who's going to have poor outcomes, and yet who's going to recover. We don't know the answers to that. So again, we, you know, all of those things, we don't have proven treatment for Takasubos, and that leads to us with really not knowing how to treat so many women. So another area of interest and area that we need to be studying so that we can better serve these patients of ours. So, um, the, and then, Going to, I, I, some of you who know me, you know I'm a preventive cardiologist. You know, even our risk factors differ based on sex. So even when we talk about the traditional risk factors, we've known for over two decades that for diabetes, for example, that women with diabetes have a much greater risk of developing cardiovascular disease compared with men. And even for hypertension now, there is data from some of my colleagues here at Cedars, Susan Chang's group. She has shown that the trajectory for systolic blood pressure is greater for women compared to men. So what makes, if women start out with lower systolic blood pressure, why do we have the same threshold as men? And I think there's going to be a lot of interesting work coming out on this because maybe women should always have lower blood pressure. So who says that we had to have the same cutoff as men? You know, for lipids, there's not so many differences, but there is for LP little a. We know for women, there's a change after menopause. So even though we think of LP little a as being sort of consistent throughout life, for women, there seems to be a rise in LP little a after menopause. So we should be checking it after menopause, even if they've had it checked before. Whereas for men, we often say, 
We don't need to check it more than once. There's data on exercise that I'll, I'll touch on. There's, you know, diseases of inflammation that put men and women at higher risk, but these are diseases that occur more frequently in women, diseases like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. Some of the work about fitness I wanted to show you, this is some of my work that demonstrated what we assumed was the same for women and men was not the case. For fitness, we had often had we know fitness was a predictor of mortality, but in terms of what your age predicted fitness level was, we actually described this for the first time in our New England Journal paper and showed that it was an independent predictor beyond other risk factors, but also heavily, very helpful for diagnosis in symptomatic women. And we validated this in another population of women. And it was very different than what it was for men. So the assumption often is, is that, oh, if we have something for men, it's the same for women. No, it's not. Same for heart rate response to exercise. We had these 6,000 women from the Women Take Heart Project. You know, 220 minus the age never worked for women. I don't even think it works for men, but it definitely didn't work for women. Our formula is not as catchy. It's 206 minus 0.88 times the age of women. But my point is just that the assumption that something works for women or works for women that's developed on men, it's just not the case. And this formula now is the formula for women because we we not only, um, again, each of these points represents one of our 6,000 women. The traditional estimate is not the same estimate for women. And we demonstrated that there was a prognostic implication using our formula. Now, in terms of how we estimate risk in women, you know, now we, we had the ASCVD risk score, and as of a few weeks ago, we now have the PREVENT risk score available to us. But both of them, you know, you look at them and you get to put in if they're male or female or not, but that's kind of it in terms of sex specificness still heavily age dependent. I've been using the PREVENT score for the last two weeks since it came out, and I feel like I can just guess the risk. It's not necessarily helping me risk stratify, particularly in young women. Again, now it includes age 30 and above, so that's a good thing, but um, it still seems very age dependent. But there are things about um, sex that are specific. You know, again, pregnancy is something that only happens to biological women. And we know that a pregnancy mortality is on the rise in the United States, unlike other countries where there's dramatic improvements. Ours are like the developing nation. And most of those risks are related to cardiovascular disease. Again, there is racial inequity. Sorry, I forgot that slide. But there, most of the causes of death in the United States are actually due to cardiovascular disease. And the best estimates that we have is about more than two thirds of those are preventable. And when we look at, you know, specifically for cardiovascular conditions, it's even higher. You can see here just what we say is that you know, most of them are preventable when they're pregnant, same within 42 days, and then out to one year, maybe slightly less. But we really do need to be able to better identify the preventable ones. That's where we're losing ground. And so we did, you know, we have this paper that, you know, we've talked about the red flag symptoms that people might present with that need to be taken seriously throughout pregnancy and then postpartum, the red flag signs that need to be also noted. And we need to be involving and having centers that involve not just prompt evaluation, but maternal fetal medicine and cardiology involved in those care groups so that we get called and get to assess them. And I'm sure your Women's Heart Center perhaps is already doing this, but this is what we really need across the nation. We wrote this paper really just giving the rationale for why we're seeing more problems in pregnancy and more cardiovascular disease. We have a society that has more pre-pregnancy risk factors. We also 
have younger people already with cardiovascular disease. Some, of course, can be born with uh, heart problems or develop heart problems as well that also may choose to still get pregnant. So we do need to have strategies to really mitigate this rise in cardiovascular disease, and this will require a team approach that will involve cardiology for sure. We need to be able to be part of that team. And I know, like I said, there's more and more centers involving them. But even from a long-term standpoint, I always call pregnancy nature's free stress test because it helps us identify women who might benefit from primary prevention efforts in the future by having certain pregnancy complications or adverse pregnancy outcomes, we know that some of these people are going to go on and develop cardiovascular disease. And I like this, this um, figure from, uh, the, from a Jack paper in 2021, where they look at the, the ones that we know, the adverse pregnancy outcomes, which are preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, gestational diabetes, preterm birth, and small for gestational age, are all associated with a heightened risk for cardiovascular disease. And then the hypertensive disorders are particularly also further associated with diabetes, heart failure, um, stroke, ischemic heart disease. So all of these need to be appreciated because 80% of women bear at least one child in the United States. And these adverse pregnancy outcomes are not rare. They're occurring in about 10 to 20% of pregnancies, depending on what what data set you look at. So these are not infrequent, especially as the maternal age is increasing. We don't know exactly why all of these adverse pregnancy outcomes increase cardiovascular disease. There may be some vascular maladaption process going on or placental dysfunction may be an announcement of this. But the point is right now, while we're, we see the person who has had these adverse pregnancy outcomes, our goal should be on prevention to reduce the risk of future cardiovascular disease. That's why we coined this term. A group of us had written this presidential statement for ACOG. It was two obstetricians and one cardiologist, as you can see with the names below. And we taught, we coined the term fourth trimester to really identify the period, not three months after, the entire period after delivery. What are the things that we should be assessing women for? And a lot of them are cardiac related because these are the things that can affect their health long term. So we do need to assess, counsel, and treat. And again, this is where women's heart centers can really be a continuum in the care for these women. And I don't have time today to talk about all the adverse pregnancy outcomes, specifically the data, or this other sex-specific risk factors that occur during a woman's life, but we meet them where they are. If you're seeing a young woman, you might be asking about age of menarche, which has been associated with an increased risk if it's too young or too late, if they're on the birth control pill and also smoking, or if they've been on the birth control for too long of a time, that can also potentially increase the risk for hypertension and ultimately affect the risk for heart disease. In the reproductive years, we need to be part of that team again for the reasons that I said. But additionally, you know, for women with premature menopause, ovarian insufficiency, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, again, knowing about this should be part of our, our history taking, part of our risk assessment for those of us in the preventive world. And certainly for older women, knowing about age of menopause, knowing if it was surgical or just early, knowing if they're using HRT or not. So we have to meet our women where we're meeting them. So to end with, I want to talk about inclusion of women in cardiovascular trials, because this has been a huge issue specific to cardiology more than any other field. And I love this cartoon. It's kind of funny, but it, it really applies to cardiology. We have studies of fruit flies, mice, hamsters, frogs, monkeys, and men with this condition, but medical research using women as subjects just never occurred to anyone. And that's so true in our field. And back in 1991, Bernadine Healy wrote this great editorial. She entitled it Yentl Syndrome. And Yentl, for those of you that don't know, Yentl wanted to study the Talmud, but she was a woman. 
And so she could not. Um, so she disguised herself as a man to be taken seriously. And if you, you know, this, you can read the story or you can watch the movie that stars Barbara Streisand. But the point being that, you know, Bernadine was trying to make the, you know, use that analogy do women have to present just like men to be taken seriously? If we don't study them, we're not going to know if there's differences or not. And she went on to even say further that she hoped that this would be a syndrome uh, that slips away back into history as a curiosity. But sadly, more than three decades later, we are still dealing with this syndrome because we still don't have enough trials with women. This is a study that some of you may be familiar with that was published in 2020, looking at the uh, the prevalence of the prevalence population enrollment of women in cardiovascular trials. And so they adjusted for the prevalence of the disease in our in our population. This is globally. And you can see only pulmonary hypertension is the only disease state that we've done a good job of enrolling women. It doesn't matter if we do studies on drugs, devices, lifestyle, or procedures. We don't enroll enough women. We, whether we look where the study's done, doesn't matter. We don't enroll women well all over the world. Doesn't matter if it's a large study or small study. We're getting better at getting women under the age of 55 into our trial, so that's good. But again, since cardiovascular disease tends to affect us more as we age, we still haven't got enough women. And when we look at sponsor type, again, sponsor type doesn't, none of the sponsor types really help getting enough women into trials. But what's interesting is when the government funding is involved in these trials, we actually do less well. And that means that there's just no accountability with government funding. And this isn't to beat up the NIH, because again, reminder, this is a global, global studies. But you would think government funding would mean there'd be a more accountability to the entire population. And then don't even get me started on pregnant women because they are relatively unstudied. There's few trials. CHAPS is one of the only trials uh, recently in our recent time that was a randomized controlled trial in pregnant women. But other than that, we really have very few trials in pregnancy. Now, all of us went to medical school, right? And we all learned about how drugs are metabolized and what mattered, right? We learned about the absorption, the distribution, metabolism, and elimination of drugs. And, and this is from our paper in the Journal of Cardiac Failure, but this doesn't apply just to heart failure drugs. This is to all the drugs, right? Adiposity affects the distribution of a drug. And so there's differences for women and there's differences for pregnant women. And we need to remember this when we're using drugs. And yet when we do drug trials and we don't include women in those trials, then we never know about how to dose them, how they will affect women. And we only learn later. Just to give an example, diuretics, we all use them every day, right, for high blood pressure and other reasons. And, you know, we know when they're metabolized, the plasma concentration in women is higher in women compared to men. So it shouldn't be surprising to us for the same dose that we get more electrolyte imbalances in women and we have more arrhythmic risk in women. Beta blockers, similarly, we also have a higher plasma concentration in women. And therefore, the heart rate response and blood pressure response is actually lower. It falls lower in women at the same doses. And I could go through all kinds of drugs we use every day in cardiology where we learned about the effect on women later. And so we, we really should not stand for that any longer. But part of the problem is how we, you know, what happened and why women weren't included in trials. So let's, just to give you a little bit of history for some of you that don't know about this, it all starts back with thalidomide in the 1960s. This drug was used for morning sickness without any studies. It did make women less morning, have more, less morning sickness, but sadly caused the offspring to be really quite harmed. So almost immediately in the 1970s, the FDA said women of childbearing potential cannot be included in trials. Phase one and phase two trials, no way. And that really set us up for not being included in any trials. Now, in the 1980s, the FDA actually made some specific requests for certain subgroups to be studied. Interestingly, it didn't include any groups by race or sex, 
The NIH started talking about recommending women to be included in studies in the 80s. And then in the 90s, when Bernadine Healy headed up the NIH, that really is when the Office of Women's Health Research was established, when the Congress mandated inclusion of women in trials. And the FDA suddenly removed the restriction for participation of women of childbearing potential. But that those prior restrictions still held up research a lot. And the Congress mandates really didn't make anybody accountable. Now in the 2000s, the FDA said, we don't know enough about pregnant women, so let's have exposure registries. And that, I guess that's good because you know, sometimes women need to remain on drugs or will not get off drugs or don't even know they're pregnant. And it was a way for us to learn about exposures. But in, in the late 2010s, you know, the FDA finally started making some expectations for medical devices. Interestingly, it wasn't until 2016 that the NIH finally mandated cell studies and animal studies to include both sexes. They were all male cell lines. They were all male animal studies. For what reason? Don't ask me. Maybe the, the female mice bit them. I don't know. But Nonetheless, they did not include them until 2016 where it was mandated. And now when you, I know it's made research, basic science research more expensive, but it's so important for us to know the preclinical data before we do things in the clinical atmosphere of humans. And it was in 2022 that finally the FDA said that sex and gender needed to be reported on devices. When we have device data, they've now mandated it. And it was also only in 2022 that the Institute of Medicine finally put out their document that I show you here about improving representation in clinical trials and research, meaning including women and including people from diverse backgrounds. So we're at the infancy of really getting women into our studies. I'll just show you one last bit of data. This is from the FDA of all the drug trials when they go up for FDA approval, the percent of women in trials. Pay attention to this yellow line, the light yellow line here that I'm tracing, with, hopefully you can see with the arrow. That is um, cardiology drugs. See in 2019 how few women percent of drugs that went up for approval included women. And only in 2020, which this is the last set of data that I have from the FDA, but even then, it's it's not even 30% in 2020. All other disease states are doing great at getting more women in trials, but not cardiology. So let's hold ourselves accountable. Let's ask these questions. Where are the women when you do trials and you present them or publish them? Because we deserve fair representation. So how will we improve outcomes in women? Like I said, we need more diversity in trials. This has to do with sex and gender. This has to do with race. The more we look like our society, the more applicable our research will be to everybody. We need to apply our guidelines equally to men and women. That's an easy way to save lives. We need to talk about the gender bias in care and ways to address it and reduce it. Women's Heart Centers will help us in the improved care of women. And we need to continue to follow our metrics in our hospitals, in our clinics, and on a national level and more globally. Let's hold our, everyone accountable to improving the outcomes of everyone. That's ultimately how we're going to improve the care of women. So I hope I've shown you today that women remain under-recognized, under-diagnosed, under-treated, and under-studied. If we just do one thing today and start giving guideline-directed medical therapy to all our patients, we'll save lives, particularly after acute myocardial infarction. We need to be asking the questions, how can we embrace the power of our electronic health records and our AI that's out there to improve the care and remove the bias that we all have when we care for patients. And lastly, I hope I've convinced you women need to be studied because there are sex differences. We just have to look for them.
So again, thank you for having me here today. And I hope I've left some time for questions. I wanted to just add though, that the government is definitely seeing this as a priority. We had the honor of having uh, First Lady Jill Biden with us just a, a few months ago, where we got to show her our exciting warrior trial that was that I told you we just closed the enrollment a little bit after her visit. And she wanted to hear about cardiovascular disease from us. And this is my amazing team team that I get to work with every day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Martha. That was an amazing um, journey through. And I think I recorded some of your slogans. Uh, let's make ourselves accountable. That's going to go right out into X very soon. Uh, well, for now, we're going to bring on our panelists and joining uh, Dr. Kulkarni and Dr. Wang is also Dr. Kamu Maganti. And Martha and Kamu go a long way to Northwestern uh, in their days. So, um, all right. So uh, I think, first of all, I think uh, I want to start off with just a general. How have you made your career so exciting? <laughs> I'm not sure if I know if it, it's some days exciting and some days I'm sure it's boring to others. But I think... I think the way to make anybody's career exciting is first of all, to find what you love and to find an area that you feel passionate about. That's the way you carve out your niche and you're the hopefully one of the experts. You don't have to be the only expert, but you, if you have that, that you know, area of expertise, it does lend yourself to think about trials. It does lend yourself to think about studies and it does lend yourself to be able to collaborate. And I think the nicest thing about cardiology is the collaborations we have across this country and now around the world. Very nice. I think we have a lot of uh, young uh, faculty, I mean, faculty and also uh, trainees, uh, I think they would be inspired by hearing about you and being able to follow your leagues. Uh, anyway, I'm going to open up the floor. Uh, maybe whoever wants to go first, maybe I'll start with Rachna. Rachna, do you want to go sure. first? Yeah. Yeah. Martha, amazing presentation. Absolutely amazing presentation. But I have heard you and I expected no difference. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, I know from my practice and from your experience, Inoka and Minoka are real, real issues and see a lot of patients with that. Um, we talked about treating them, but can you shed some light on the diagnostic tools that you use for that? Yeah. So, you know, the nice thing was that I got to chair those chest pain guidelines mm -hmm. and that meant I got to sneak in things that I wanted to make sure were there. One of them was the evaluation for Anoka, and you may know it's not that I've memorized my own guidelines, but as I believe it's figure 12. It really does outline a pathway to look and examine non-obstructive coronary disease. There's on one arm, there's the coronary function testing, which if your cath lab does that, that's a great way to be it for the more difficult patients to really tease out what's going on and definitely gives us a better diagnosis, meaning you know, we can say that it's non-cardiac, or we might say that it's coronary microvascular dysfunction due to endothelial dysfunction, or we might make a diagnosis of vasospasm, or it might be a combination of the two. And that might help you know how to target the treatment. But for the imagers out there and for centers that don't do coronary function testing, because I, I will say that at one time, a short time ago, I remember there was only like two or three places. And when Camo and I were at Northwestern, I started doing coronary function testing. It was really hard because nobody wanted to do my coronary function testing for me. Not every cath lab loves that. I hope that changes over time. But imaging is a useful modality that can help us as well. And we do have data, particularly with newer technology, yeah. um, HET, as well as cardiac MRI can help make that diagnosis. And that's actually in our guidelines as well. It isn't perhaps as definitive. It's a little hard to make the diagnosis of vasospasm, for example. Um, but not everybody needs, I would say that I don't use coronary function testing on everyone because the reality is it tends to be the patients who've been living with it longer or where we're struggling treating them empirically that I might go to coronary function testing because it is an invasive test and they probably already have been cath, to be honest. Many of them already have. So it's hard to do sometimes at the same time as the cath. 
So every place though, if you create a protocol that works for your group, I think that's the, a good way to approach it. And that's why we gave a non-invasive way as well as an invasive way. And if you're lucky and you have both, then you'll use them the way that you, you know, the way that your center decides to use them. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And I love the comment you made that in cath lab, we should stop saying, oh, it, does, it doesn't look like cardiac. Yeah, false positive. We have, yeah, whatever. we have to yeah. go beyond that. Fantastic. Uh, Yanting, do you want to go next? Yes, thank you, Dr. Galati, for this wonderful presentation and really stressing the lack of research in women and in pregnancy. Um, you know, I was talking to, uh, even within our own institution, Dr. Yamamala and our research coordinator, Gia, how can we enroll more women in our pre-existing clinical trial? Um, do you find having more female research staff talking to patients helpful? Is it implicit bias training? How how can we get more women in our clinical trials? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest, I didn't get to talk a lot about that and I apologize, but I do think that one of the biggest barriers of why women haven't been included in research is because women have, women researchers have been left out as well. We, we know that if we have diversity at anything, whether it's the leadership board or whether it's a research group or whatever, you have more diversity, you're gonna have more creativity, more good ideas, more thoughts about people that look like ourselves, right? We'll be like, maybe someone like me would say, well, there's not enough South Asians in this study. You know, I don't know. But you think about what are the barriers and how do we overcome those barriers? And the more women that are invited to the table, it is more likely that research will become more diverse. Similarly, we should be thinking also about, you know, race and ethnicity. And, and other things where people, social economic status, where people come from, help us think, okay, well, the, who will enroll in this trial if it costs them to enroll? Or, you know, then we know who's going to be part of our trials. Is that who we want? Is that who's affected by this disease? So I do think we need more diversity. This comes, you know, from pharma trials. There should be women leading them. And I get very frustrated when they don't um, include enough women in the leadership, you know, whenever we look at these big trials presented at ACC and AHA and that get New England Journal of Medicine attention, these are run usually by pharma. And, you know, having just one woman isn't enough. It, it needs to be more fair. There's a lot of people who have been in this field for some time, me included, and I've never been invited to some of those big pharma trials. And I'm like, how long do I have to, like now I'm senior, I'm an old lady now. And I, I'm like, when will I get invited to be part of that? And, and we start, we've now sat with pharma asking these questions because the older generation of physicians that's predominantly run a lot of these trials, they're gonna eventually retire. They will not be able to run that. They haven't trained the younger generation to be part of it. And we should be thinking about that pipeline of how to do our trials differently in this modern era. And that means involving everyone, involving communities, involving um, universities, involving, you know, clinical settings. That's the way we'll get these trials done quickly. And that, that should be of interest also to pharma because now the life of their drugs, and I know I'm just talking about pharmaceutical drugs, but it's going to become shorter and shorter because of some of the acts that are being pushed by the government in terms of the length of time that they can keep their even their patent. So we need to be thinking about that. We need to be thinking about that about devices, but we need more people from more diverse backgrounds. And I think even at your own centers, think about ways to involve younger people too, so that they can have the opportunity to gain those skills. None of us necessarily come out of our training with those skills, depending, most of us were doing good clinical training and that's what fellowship really is for. But then how do you learn to do the research? You learn by great mentors and you learn from others. And, and, and there's, you know, there's definitely skills I feel that I could have, maybe gained if I had maybe realized how important they were at a younger stage. But I want our next generation of cardiologists to gain those skills if they're interested in being part of them. Great. And then Dr. Maganti, yeah. 
Martha, once again, amazing, amazing talk. I continue to learn from you always. And for those of you who don't know about this, she is the Michelin star rated Michelin. baker. I have had some of the best cookies that Martha has made. Continue to learn from her. And uh, our fellows were just so lucky to have her mentor them. Uh, Priya obviously comes to mind. But I have a couple of questions. Do you think um, maybe instituting something like um, get with the guidelines would be a good way of addressing some of the gaps that are there when it comes to women and heart disease on multiple fronts? Well, I think get with the guidelines, which is also known as the NCDR data, is definitely useful for us to see the gaps. And that's actually where a lot of the early data, I didn't show it necessarily to you, but that's where some of the early data showed us, you know, that that shed light on door to balloon time, just nationally, how, what we were doing and what individual hospitals were doing. And by shedding that light, it changed so much so that hospitals started achieving, they didn't want to be the ones that were achieving poor door to balloon time. So they quickly all got their acts together. I think that it also showed us the gaps based on sex or based on gender. So it's a useful way to keep watching our data. I don't know if it's a way to implement anything. It's just going to tell us what, how we improve over time. But it is a good marker. I think that some of the things that we can think about, though, in terms of people should be thinking about implementation science. How do we change things? And it can be in small ways, something that's effective at your institution, that, you know, quality projects can be the beginning of change. And, and I think those are the ways at least to start, um, because I think that those are the ways that we will find solutions. Electronic health record prompts, for example, that are effective and not annoying are things that we all need to know. Well, do they work? Are they effective? Or are they just annoying? And then just to your baking thing, I'll just tell you one little thing. I did actually bake this weekend because it was pouring rain and there was nothing to do. And I, I baked cinnamon rolls, which is not heart healthy at all. And my dog, or my, my yeah, my youngest dog actually ate them this morning all off the counter before we even got to eat one. So I guess that was like a way to keep uh, unhealthy food from us, but she ate all eight of them. So I just had to share that, which has nothing to do with cardiology. No. <laughs> so the second question I had is, remember there was a bit of interest about looking at vascular reactivity in pregnant women? I know nothing further actually moved into that area by doing like non-invasive uh, tonometry or palination tonometry or anything like that. Have we been pushing the needle to look into that or not at all? I, I don't see a lot of data on that. I mean, I think a lot of the vascular assessment in pregnancy has come from looking at the placenta and not enough on the, um, it, you know, doing whether it's brachial flow or some of the other things that we do um, in pregnancy. But we do need, you know, people with creative ideas should be thinking about that because, you know, really for pregnancy related, you could think of any question, we need that trial. There's literally not enough done on pregnant women. Um, and, and it is a major issue. And it's a major issue, particularly in the United States, where these outcomes, of course, acutely are not good. So there's those solutions. But really, for long term, I think we need to figure out what is, you know, is it just prevention, you know, or is there Hmm. We I think we just uh, lost her uh, for a second uh, here. We'll just wait for us to come back. That people are using and that, that, that can be helpful as well, but we don't have a good predictive model. Well, thank you so much again, Marta. I will open it up to everybody. If anybody has questions, please send it via text or please speak up. Um, Patha and Martha, do, you, do we have any time for one more question? For yes, me? yes, please go ahead, Rashna. Thank you. Uh, Martha, can you share your thoughts 
uh, on hormone replacement therapy in postmenopausal women? Yeah, I almost cannot give a talk and escape that question, can I? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so hormone replacement therapy, you know, when we did the Women's Health Initiative study, of course, that we were using a very different level of estrogen than we have out today. Yeah. Also, I, I agree, Women's Health Initiative was a great study, but it was an imperfect study. There was enrollment of older women as yeah. much as women going through menopause. And so the data with the you know, analysis later, which was never, you know, a pre-specified endpoint, but the analysis later did show that younger women that were probably going through menopause at that time did not have harm. And I guess we would say at least it's neutral. It's not harmful to women if they need it for their symptoms. And now in this day and age with the low estrogen doses yeah. of HRT, mm -hmm. I'm pretty comfortable in telling women who need it for symptoms to take it, you know, if they need it. And I also say for the shortest duration too, which, you know, they need to decide with their OB when to stop it. But I think in this day and age, it's a different level of HRT. And when you need symptoms, quality of life really does matter. And I think as long as the other risks that they're not have a higher risk for breast cancer, that they, you know, don't have a prothrombotic milieu, you know, as long as the people are, are following that, I think it's okay. And do you see any difference between uh, local, like vaginal therapy versus oral? So I do recommend if, if, well, certainly if cardiac patients need to be on it, I definitely ask them to be on transdermal yeah. uh, rather than orals. But if there's somebody at high risk for cardiovascular disease, because usually if I'm seeing them, there's maybe, maybe they have an elevated LDL, maybe they have an elevated LP little a or, or something that's put them at higher risk. And I still make that recommendation to think about that rather than an oral version. Right. I'm not, you know, I'm not a fan of bioidenticals, even though I live in California and it feels like everybody is on bioidentical these days. But there's absolutely no evidence for bioidentical hormones. Nobody knows exactly everyone's hormonal milieu. And so it's kind of a marketing tool. And also once they're implanted, you can't get them out. They, they actually literally implant those hormones, whoever knew, but that's what they do. And so I think it's quite harmful to women. Um, and we do see a lot of women with other symptoms because of ridiculous dosing. And many times they're getting also high doses of testosterone and they're not necessarily aware of that. And I don't, I don't think we have enough evidence to say that every postmenopausal woman needs testosterone. Agree. Well, this is, you know, I, I see this every day and the, these questions do get asked so often. Yeah, there's a question in the chat. Uh, are there any inherent gender stereotypes associated with symptom recognition and presentation by women? Well, we do know that when women's symptoms, as I already kind of presented, women sim who present with certain symptoms, particularly pain of any sort, gets treated differently and discounted quite a bit. And I know from a obstetricians, they'll talk, a gynecologist will talk about this a lot too. And certainly from cardiac disease, we do know that when women present, even when they're screaming out the word chest pain, there is a inherent bias towards treating them or seeing them that they're at risk. So a lot of when we talked, you know, our guidelines were written for cardiology, but they were also written for every physician who deals with chest pain, which is just about everyone. Our ER colleagues are often the first line as well as our primary care, right? When they get to cardiology, that's all we think about is the heart. But we need from wherever they're met to be seen for their symptoms. So we do need to really talk with our community and really get them to understand these differences because I think the more we talk about the bias in care, hopefully they will be able to be like, oh, did I just discount that person's symptoms we know that it happens though much more to women than men and we but we also know that if there's more female physicians down in the emergency room the care of women actually improves including the care of male physicians in the er so there is you know a way to make it better it's just bring in more women 
Yeah, and Marta, I wanted to ask you a question, and this is maybe a little bit more on my hypothesis, or maybe, to be honest, my not knowing it, the literature well. What is the relationship between uh, obesity and uh, Inoka? Yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, you know, Inoka is heavily linked, or there's an association between Anoka and Hefpath these days that we're understanding way more about more that inflammatory milieu see for Hefpath particularly is an issue. And then that link between Anoka, and we know that for Hefpath, 80% of patients with Hefpath have obesity. So there's most definitely a link. Not everyone with ANOCA has HEFPAF. So it, it right now, I call ANOCA almost like a bucket. We put a lot of things in there that perhaps one day we'll have separate diagnoses like coronary microvascular dysfunction, vasospasm, and maybe those are, things are completely different. And I think they are, but we, we need more information. But at one point, we will be able to say ANOCA with, you know, or whatever, coronary microvascular dysfunction with HEFPAF, and that would be a different group. And so it is interesting to think in this day of obesity medications that, again, might that might you be able to effectively just treat the obesity and would that take their symptoms away? And uh, I think that's a question that is of interest to many of us. Yeah, so I was thinking about that because it's uh, not uncommon to encounter uh, a little overweight uh, woman who have the chest pain, and you're wondering whether the microvascular, what can you do for the microvascular dysfunction? And if you could somehow do a weight loss medication, I mean, it's now that is so easily available, but not specifically for this particular indication. And, and sometimes you don't have morbid obesity, right? It's kind of um, in the borderline range and you may not have actual regulatory uh, approval to be able to use it. Maybe that's an area of study that we need to look into and see how. Um, yep, absolutely. And I think that, that that's a, you know, we'll know more about the treatment of uh, ANOCA in general because we don't really have a yeah. treatment. And yeah. WARRIOR is our first randomized trial. We hope this year by, we don't know, we close the study in July, like our follow-up. So we're hoping maybe for AHA we'll be presenting the yeah. results of WARRIOR but that that might be aspirational, but that, that is our goal. So that at least will be a start to knowing how best to treat these women because the reality, I don't want to fool anyone. We don't have a good treatment right now. We might be, I might have an approach yeah. very similar to the warrior trial, but do I know that it works? I mostly am targeting symptoms and that's ultimately what we're all doing, right? We can't mm -hmm. say that we're improving outcomes. So you kept the crowd very spellbound. There are like 45 plus people right now and still actively asking questions. I'm going to put two more if it's okay with you and then we'll uh, have it uh, the end of the session. So the question that comes in, in the era of high sensitivity troponin era, do you think um, that would alleviate some, some of the biases? So I, I wonder whether the question is coming is, how is high troponin sensitivity testing is led to a difficulty in evaluating chest pain and giving it more importance? Well, my answer to you would be maybe. You know, first things first, high sensitivity cardiac troponin, you know, we, within our guidelines, we didn't make it, we didn't force you all to um, have a sex-specific cutoff. But the data suggests, though, that sex-specific cutoff is appropriate. We, we need enough more data in the U.S. population to know and what I've seen across the country is that many hospitals have chosen to not have a sex-specific cutoff uh, where I was. We, we, at Cedars, we will. We're just rolling it out now. But where I was before, they chose not to. They said, oh, people won't know if they're male or female. It'd be so complicated and they didn't want to have it. And yet again, the way to improve diagnosis of women is to use a sex-specific cutoffs because that again, we have a lot of data supporting that. Um, so yes, if we use it, maybe we will, but it does still require somebody getting blood drawn, right? So um, that's part of it is the troponin, right? You've got to check it to know if, if it's elevated. 
And then again, if you don't have the sex specific cutoff, still you might miss some women. And that that's what we found is when you use 99 percentile for women, then you were more able to detect things. And, and I think, again, I, I hope that will change in the US, but I will say the majority of places are not using a sex cutoff. I don't know what you guys are using in your hospital. No, we don't have as yet uh, sex uh, cutoff. Yeah. So we need to move towards in that direction. Uh, a quick, two quick ones. Uh, so and uh, recent data on myocardial blood flow reserve with PET, CMR, CD, and the second one, thoughts on predictive value of zero calcium score in post-monopausal women. Yeah, so you, it's, it's less likely to have a coronary calcium score of zero and then have my, uh, coronary microvascular dysfunction, but you can still have vasospasm, right? So it's still possible. Um, certainly we, we tend to use a lot of CCTA um, as part of our, our diagnosis. I'm not sure if I caught the rest of the question because there was something. So the first one was uh, myocardial blood flow reserve using PET, CMR, or CT. Yeah. So I think that, again, um, I think that is excellent to use, especially if you have it. We use it more and more in our clinical settings. And certainly, as you would know, even um, in our chest pain gu guidelines, we talk about using FFRs C with CT, but I think that you can use SPEC and in, in PET specifically, PET specifically in that way. Um, and I think that that's the value. I think in most of the data, particularly also related to Inoka, um, I think the stronger data comes from PET scanning. Fantastic. So this has been an amazing evening, uh, Martha. Thank you very much. And also thank all the uh, panelists, Dr. Kulkarni, Dr. Wang, and Dr. Maganti, and everyone else who have been holding on for the last one and a half, almost one and a half hours. So this has been excellent. We look forward to also inviting you perhaps in the near future in person. Yes, I would love it. Right. Well, thank, thank you, you thank very you much. For having me. Thank you, Martha. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.